So with that and no more hands, uh, item B, please. Item 6B, receive an oral update on the San Bruno Recreation and Aquatic Center project. Thank you, and we'll start with the city manager. You can bring in um, whoever you need to uh, at the appropriate time. Okay, Mr. Mayor, one second as we uh, bring up the PowerPoint. Hold on, city manager. I'm I'm looking back at uh, the board. There is a uh, a gentleman who has the hand up, and I believe it, it might it may be for the uh, last item that we just had. So I'm just seeing that now. So um, city clerk, can you uh, let him in and and make sure he's heard? Yes, Paul Wapensky. Hi, Paul. Me? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's about the issue that's going to be discussed on the next issue. Not if you want me to wait, I'll wait. Okay, about the rack the rack item update. Yes. You're, 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 thank okay. you, sir. Um, you're you're quick. So uh, yes, I'll keep note of that, and as soon as we're done, we'll certainly uh, uh, turn it right to you. City manager. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, providing a oral update on the Aquatic and Recreation Center uh, with a number of our consultant partners that have been working on the project. Uh, as the community uh, knows, bringing this vision to reality uh, has been years in the making. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of 2021, uh, we are excited to be approaching uh, groundbreaking and demolition. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, we will uh, provide the city council uh, and the public uh, with an update on where we are. And so we will talk about design, we will talk about project management, uh, project schedule and budget, and then we'll have questions. Uh, and so uh, I will turn it over uh, first uh, to Don Mertz uh, from Group 4. Uh, who has been uh, our designer uh, on this project. And so, uh, Melissa, can you make sure uh, she and both Kelly Biggs uh, from Good City Company, who will join in the presentation, are in the room. Uh, and so, uh, Don, I'm not seeing you right now. Uh, well, you're here. Okay, so Don, I'm here. I will turn it over to you and uh, please begin. All right, excellent. Um, Thank you, and good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Don Marcus with Group 4 Architecture. My pleasure to be able to give you the update tonight on the San Bruno Recreation and Aquatic Center. Um, looking at the view that's on your screen right now, you can, oops, um, uh, this is really looking across City Park Way at the new community hall, back towards Crystal Springs where the eucalyptus trees are in the background there. This is looking into uh, the community hall on the second floor and the classrooms on the first floor. Looking beyond that, you'll see the entry trellis, which designates the entry into the two-story volume of the lobby. And then behind that, you can actually see the group exercise room. And then beyond, as you move, start moving up the hill, there's our public plaza with our flag, existing uh, oak tree, and the stadium seating um, that goes up into what I'll call the natatorium, um, the natatorium lawn there. And the next slide, please. So just to give you a reference from what is there today, um, up at the top of the screen, we have Crystal Springs. You can see as City Park Way turns into the park, you have a combination of the on-site parking with the creek, which runs through that culvert as it reconnects to the underground culvert, the existing recreation center, and then the existing pool. And so this is just all reference as we go to the next slide. 
Um, and here we've overlaid the improvements that are planned for the new recreation center. Um, as you can see, coming in off Crystal Springs at the entry to City Parkway, we have separated the parking away from City Parkway with its own entry and access. We have also taken the creek and separated it out of the drive and realigned it through the park to connect to the culvert at that new location indicated there. Um, as you go closer to the recreation center, you can see our public plaza where we have the existing oak tree and it creates a lovely place for all different events for the community to host there. We have an existing redwood tree that is at the secondary entry that goes into the natatorium lobby. And going up that stadium seating, as we start moving up the site, you can see we have the lawn that we'll call the natatorium lawn um, that really complements what's going on inside the building there. So to the next slide. One of the things that was approved last spring was the exterior color and material palette. And this was reviewed by the ARC and had really positive feedback. We're looking at using an exterior insulation finish system. And you can see the palette really is directly related back to the community input that we got in 2018 when we asked the community what design values they wanted to see in the new building. And so really it's inspired by nature, warm tones. We're using a natural stone veneer as our accents. And then we're complementing that with a little bit darker color on a window mullions and then a wood look trellis at the entryway. And moving a little bit further down City Parkway, kind of standing back by the creek, looking back to the building, you can kind of see the three parts to the building from the community hall spaces on the right, the lobby with the gym clear story windows raising up beyond that. That's the gym's roof popping up there, letting natural light into the gym. And then we have the group exercise on the second floor with staff on the first floor, and then the natatorium further up the hill. And you can see how we use that accent stone to designate the entry and the community hall. And then as we go to the next slide, we'll move up towards the natatorium. And you can see how we've also, again, used the uh, yeah. natural stone to accent the volume of the natatorium, really accenting where we're letting the daylighting in on this corner. We have um, a large opening. It's a garage door, glass garage door that opens up and allows that indoor outdoor connection that is going to be so lovely at the site, allowing people to come in and out. Um, with an enclosed deck on this top level. The two other rooms that complement the natatorium on that lower massing are the two party rooms. That really is a lovely complement to the activities that are happening in the natatorium. And then again, the same clear story shed roof that pops up to let the natural light into the gymnasium, you see here on the natatorium as well. So really bringing natural light into the large spaces, that north light, it will be through uh, translucent glazing to control glare as well. Next slide. So one of the things we've been working hard with staff and the advisory committee is moving into the inside of the building and doing the material and color palette selection for the interior. Our advisory committee has been guiding us in this selection and this shows you what the main lobby will look like uh, looking back from the reception desk, uh, back towards the community hall and the classrooms. You can see the stair that goes up to the second floor, which is directly complemented by an elevator on the left side. Again, you can see the transparency of the building, bringing that indoors um, and letting that outdoors come into it. The color palette using the wood in our vertical wood um, slots here or slats here and then polished concrete floor and then for the steel using a nice warm green which is accented by a warm gray. Next slide is just fine. And then moving up to the other secondary lobby at the natatorium again using our wood slats both vertically and horizontally as an accent material. Uh, polished concrete and then the warm gray. Um, just to the left that you can't see here is the redwood tree, the existing redwood tree that we are using as a 
kind of a landmark for the secondary entry. And what else you can also see in this view is the, um, the structural framing that we have in our, our cross framing here. And this is one of the things that we have discussed with staff and looked at using a little upgrade in our connection. So instead of using um, a less aesthetically pleasing connection for these structural members, we're actually using uh, pin connections on these members, just so that we can allow that transparency um, from space to space and from inside to outside. Next slide, please. Now from the natatorium, we're looking back to that glass corner that we looked at from the outside where we have the glass garage door that opens up and allows people to move inside and outside. We have the two glazed entries that go into the two party rooms that complement the natatorium. And then up high, you can see just as the clear story window is starting here, the first angle of it, it actually continues all the way around behind us so as glazing um, is aimed towards that north light. And then we also have on the second floor transparency from the cardio room looking down, separated by glazing into the natatorium. So a lot of interconnective spaces with glazing uh, throughout the building as well as from the indoors to the outdoors. And again, this color palette is something that we've been working with the advisory committee on, and specifically in the community call, um, which is on the second floor of the community center side of the building. Uh, the advisory committee um, gave us some really good input, uh, suggested that we use the wood floor that you see here. It's an oak uh, flooring, and one of their uh, good insights was to make sure we use a pattern in the flooring that will uh, not show wear and tear and will be easily maintained over time. So using the wood slats as their vertical and horizontal accent, transparency out to the creek, that tree canopy that you see in those windows is going to be the trees that are out there um, aligning the creek and is going to create this magnificent backdrop to this space. The bottom image on your right actually turns around and looks to the second half of the room where the catering kitchen is located. And then moving on, uh, additional comments and recommendations came from the advisor committee in the finishes and the patterns of the restrooms. What you hear is, uh, see here is a sample of the community hall restrooms up on the second floor there. And they show really kind of a nice refined palette, uh, very timeless and easily maintained. Next slide. Uh, the group exercise room, uh, showing our athletic wood flooring. Um, you can see how the structure does show through. So one of the important things was that our connections be clean and attractive. Um, uh, transparency out to the street, as well as with peekaboo windows on the far left side, which you can look back into the lobby, as well as back to the running track, which is on the left side of the wall that you cannot see here. Next slide. Uh, so that is my summary for this evening, and I think I get to hand it over to Kelly, who is going to give you an update on the work in progress and the CEQA and NEPA. Happy to answer questions afterwards, um, but with that, Kelly. Thank you, Dawn. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I'm Kelly Beggs, Contract Senior Planner with Good City Company. Um, as Dawn mentioned, I'll be going over some of our current work in progress. I could go to the next slide. Perfect. This slide pres presents work in progress during the current phase of the project in which the team is developing and reviewing construction documents for the project. The building permit plan check drawings were submitted on July 1st with the second submittal being submitted within the next week. Um, Pre-qualifications for general contractors were advertised twice and questionnaires were due to the city at the end of July. The city received eight pre-qualification submissions, five of which met requirements. Um, the internal steering committee has been meeting weekly and the design team has also been holding technical meetings with individual departments on an as needed basis. Advisory committee meetings have also been occurring quarterly with multiple meetings being held in September and foundation meetings, parks and rec commission meetings have also been occurring regularly. 
Um, and then lastly, we're happy to provide this update to council tonight. Next, I'll move on to our agency permitting efforts. Um, as part of the environmental impact report prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, we are currently implementing the project's mitigation monitoring and reporting plan. This plan outlines actions that the city is required to take to mitigate potentially significant environmental impacts, and that includes agency permitting related to relocation of El Zanjan Creek. Um, as you may recall, the creek is being relocated out of the public right-of-way. It currently runs behind parking stalls on City Parkway, um, and that's to improve pedestrian and vehicular safety, as well as to accommodate the new parking lot and road realignment. So to do that relocation, permits are required from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. All of these permits were submitted in August and early September, and staff and consultants are currently coordinating with agencies on those applications um, and comments. So the permitting process with the Army Corps is the most complex as it triggers review under the National Environmental Policy Act. The Army Corps has jurisdiction over the creek as it is considered to be waters of the United States. Um, but the scope of their review does include the entire project, not just the creek relocation. As described in the project's environmental impact report, the Veterans Memorial Building is considered to be a historic st structure that is eligible for the state and national registers of historic places. Um, and because of the demolition of that resource, the Corps must conduct something called Section 106 consultation with the State Historic Preservation Office to evaluate impacts to historic buildings and any other historic resources affected by the project. Um, what we've also been asked during the Army Corps review process is to conduct some additional exploration for potential archaeological sites within the project vicinity that could be eligible for these historic registers. So staff and consultants have quickly mobilized to perform testing in the project area, and we have been able to clarify that there are eligible sites in proximity to the project. We have determined that those sites would not be adversely impacted through project construction, um, and part of ensuring that there would not be impacts. Um, we will be including tribal and archaeological monitors um, that will be required to be present during certain stages of construction to ensure that none of these resources are disturbed. So moving on to the next slide, um, I believe I get to hand this back over to the city manager. Perfect. So I'll pick it uh, back up here and Don and Kelly and to the entire team, thank you uh, for everything you've been doing. and. and that was a, a very, very quick overview of hours and hours of work that has been occurring uh, uh, literally every week. Uh, so, so thank you very much. And so, um, Council, what I'll walk you through uh, is now the schedule in the budget. Uh, and so what does all this mean? And so uh, our prior schedule, we were looking to break ground in January 2021. Uh, the honest answer is that has been pushed back due to the continued work uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and some of the regional permitting bodies. And so we're currently projected uh, to uh, break ground in March of 2021. Uh, that said, with that delay, uh, the city team and the consultant team have been uh, strategizing because time is money. Uh, and so we are continuing the process of uh, going, uh, uh, finalizing the design package and going out to bid. And we are projecting that to occur in December. Uh, and so we are uh, continuing to move forward and uh, like always adjusting on the fly. Uh, but as we'll see in a little bit, uh, additional time does equate to additional money. And so where we are, where are we with the project budget? Uh, so as the uh, council and the public will remember, uh, sort of back in June, 2018, the initial project budget was $50 million. Uh, and there was a number of value engineering uh, that actually brought the, the budget down to that. Um, the grant that is coming to the city from the San Bruno Community Foundation is 50 million. Uh, and really uh, back in both 2018 and 2020, we had a hard um, reality to swallow, which is the building that the community wants, that the community envis envisions, and frankly, just to replace a lot of what we have now 
uh, cannot be accomplished uh, by $50 million. And so in May 2020, we came to you with a budget uh, that was value engineered down uh, and separated out a base building from some ad alternatives. And so the base building uh, was $60 million. That included adding a enhanced community lounge and an elevated walking uh, track, as well as uh, additional cost increases for project contingency and, and escalation. A number of the, the things, a number of items actually came out of the budget at that time. Uh, one of the things were additional improvements to the park that were initially envisioned, uh, frankly, just because we could not afford them. Uh, other things were done, such as moving some elements of, for example, creating additional parking spaces near Tom Lark Field uh, was moved out of the direct project construction budget uh, and advanced uh, through work that the Public Works Department is doing. And so while it will be paid for by the project budget, uh, we are actually saving money by doing that sooner uh, and not as a sub under the general for the building. And then we pulled out uh, a few alternatives. Uh, one is the outdoor pool. Uh, that is a significant uh, benefit to the, the community. It also includes a zero depth entry splash pad uh, and a generator. Uh, and so that uh, was pulled out as, as, and cost $3.4 million. And so uh, the total back in January of 2020 was 63.4. And as you'll see in the next slide, that number has increased uh, by uh, $4 million. And so the base building now is projected uh, to cost 61.4. There are a number of additional project items, 2.8 million, uh, that were envisioned, uh, but are funded by other sources. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. And so those have now been added to the project budget, but it's important to note that they're not added costs that have not been uh, accounted for. Uh, another important note on uh, this addi additional project work Again, value engineering the building because unfortunately with what it costs um, uh, to, uh, to construct now, we cannot afford uh, the full photovoltaic system or the solar panel system. And so we are providing all the wiring and the design to add solar panels later in the future, uh, but we are working with other partners uh, to hopefully attain grant funds or fund that as a, as a later phase. But it's important to note that phase one does not include actually installing the solar panels on the roof or other uh, equipment because the plan for solar also calls for solar uh, in some of the parking lots. And the enhanced uh, amenities uh, came down just about $200,000 uh, to 3.2. And there's a very detailed model that uh, we, we went through with the advisory committee and staff has worked on. But top line summary, uh, from May to September, there's an increase of $4 million. And so let's talk about that, right? Where does that additional cost come from? Now, one in the model, there's a lot of up and downs. And so what we wanted to call out here, is some of the key elements that increased. Uh, one is what was added to the budget is this work funded by other funds, uh, sort of related to the project, but not funded by the project. And we'll talk about that. Expanded fitness and cardio room. Uh, there was empty roof area uh, adjacent to the fitness and cardio room. And we were able to, in the design, almost double the size of that room, uh, providing more equipment, more space, um, uh, a better atmosphere for the users at a cost of uh, $500,000. Yes, a significant cost, but something that you, you'll, you have to do today if you're gonna do it. Uh, and the team and the advisory committee really supported that uh, given uh, that additional roof space that was not going to be utilized uh, in the initial design. There are increased plan check fees of uh, just under $600,000. Yes, this is a city project, uh, but, but we have to pay uh, permit fees. Uh, your staff is looking into ways um, to get that number down lower, uh, but that has been added to the budget. Uh, there's additional work for the environmental processes, uh, $285,000. Uh, the four-month increase in construction uh, has added approximately $550,000 to the budget uh, and those pin break frame connections, $221,000. And so again, there's been up and downs in the model. Uh, and since we last came to you, uh, we're up $4 million and, and this breaks down a total of $5 million in additional costs. So knowing the model between a, a number of the ins and outs, uh, there was a million saved. 
And so highlighting really quickly uh, for the council, what are those ad additional items that are funded um, by other sources? A significant number are water and sewer projects with the relocation of City Parkway or the realignment of City Parkway. Uh, we do need to uh, replace the water and sewer uh, mains that run in City Parkway. And essentially what we're doing is advancing the replacement uh, of those pipelines that will be funded by the sewer and water pipeline, uh, the sewer and water uh, project funds. Next is a traffic signal or roundabout um, or potentially another traffic calming measure. Uh, and this is at the intersection of Crystal Springs and Oak, an intersection that everyone in the community knows well that even has some traffic challenges today uh, during AM and peak uh, commute hours. Uh, and so a larger building uh, will, yes, add more traffic. Uh, and that triggers uh, looking at uh, doing something about this intersection. Uh, and so we're looking at a traffic signal or a roundabout, and we are projecting to fund that uh, through our normal uh, traffic uh, calming and uh, traffic funds, potentially measure A or gas tax. Uh, and so that is called out at, at a total of $800,000. Uh, sitting at fiber relocation, uh, we do have fiber uh, that runs uh, underground um, and that not only powers our rec center, but also powers our senior center. And this tr project will trigger uh, the relocation of that. And so that's a cost of approximately 155,000. And then council will remember, uh, we allocated from the city art fund uh, $50,000 to uh, relocate the flame memorial structure uh, that uh, currently sits on a part of the park uh, that will undergo construction uh, and uh, we're relocating that to another part of the park. So that's the uh, $2.8 million in costs uh, attached to the project, but that are funded by other sources. Uh, the next question you may have, well, with this increase in cost, what contingency do you have in the budget? And uh, I won't go through all of these in details, but the point of it is to let the council know uh, that we do have significant contingencies built into this budget, uh, not only for the, the design work that is still yet to be completed, escalation, because when we buy a piece of drywall, uh, a year and a half or two years from now, it'll cost more than uh, what we're projecting, and, and we are reflecting that uh, throughout the entire model. Uh, there's an empty uh, line item or line item that's not filled in yet because we've had a number of uh, conversations on will there be additional COVID-19 related costs uh, to the project that we need to budget for. We have not made that decision yet, uh, but that's there just as a, as a flag that, that uh, it may be there in the future. Our, uh, corporate yard parking, uh, that project has some contingency built into it. We have contingency on those projects that are funded by other funds. And then like every project, there's a, uh, there's a contingency on hard construction costs, as well as FF&E, fixtures, furnitures, and equipment. So know that this full budget includes fully furnishing the building, not just building uh, uh, the shale. So all of the tables, chairs, and equipment, uh, IT infrastructure, computers, desks, tables, et cetera, is fully covered in the budget, as well as other contingencies. So know that we are building a robust budget uh, to account for uh, contingencies. And so top line summary, where are we? And so this table breaks down phase one. Uh, and so to bring uh, the community the phase one building, uh, and that's essentially everything uh, outside of those enhanced facilities, we have a current gap of 3.7 million. Uh, what's shown in the table is we currently have uh, the $50 million from the foundation. Uh, currently, uh, we have 3.1 million uh, in park and loop funds, and we are anticipating uh, development related community benefits to come to the city council for approval later this year uh, that will provide 4.5 million to the project and that leaves a 3.7 million dollar gap that we need to still find and fund uh, for phase one uh, the other work is fully funded um, and then we have our enhanced community facilities uh, that is the 3.2 million and so there's currently uh, a gap that your, 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 your staff team is working hard to fill and come to you with solutions for. And so we will continue uh, on, on that work forthrightly. Uh, what's on the screen now is a, a high level summary of potential avenues uh, to close that gap. One of the things we can do is issue debt, uh, whether it's 5 million or 10 million, uh, we have um, 
figures there for what, what that estimated annual payment will be if we took on 15 mil, 15, a 15 year debt. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'll tell the city council and the community, uh, given the, the revenue sources um, that are coming to bear on this uh, $67 million project, uh, if the money that we have to put in is $10 million uh, or even $5 million in debt, uh, we're doing pretty good uh, to get a facility of this magnitude uh, for the community um, by taking on, um, you know, five to $10 million in debt, uh, if, if that's what's needed. Uh, we also uh, are tabulating uh, residual PGME settlement funds, and we believe that there uh, is likely one to $2 million um, uh, as we close out that project that can be brought to bear uh, subject to council approval on this project. Uh, we have PGE undergrounding credits that we may uh, apply to the project, again, subject to council approval that we'll bring forward to you. Uh, as we know, there are additional community benefits uh, for some projects that have been approved, other projects that are in, in the pipeline, and we can talk about either partial or full funding of the Delta with those community benefits, as well as development impact fees uh, for projects uh, uh, that are adopted uh, and uh, some projects that are very much in the pipeline. Uh, as well as seeking a Measure K allocation or loan from the county and a potential allocation of Measure G uh, put there as the last item uh, on purpose because it is the last item we're going to. And so uh, top line summary, summary is we have levers to pull. Uh, we are continuing to work on this. Uh, given where we are, it will likely take uh, issuing debt for that gap financing, even if uh, we do decide that we're going to use a combination of strategies, uh, uh, development impact fees or community benefits. It's worth noting that uh, when the city adopted uh, your robust development impact fees, community facilities are a line item in those development impact fees. And so those are meant to pay for uh, projects like this. And so uh, we are um, working uh, on this. And as we approach construction, uh, we'll come to, to the city council with a full financing plan uh, for the building uh, to return, uh, to, to build this asset for the community. And right now it is our mission uh, to present council with a plan to build the entire building, both phase one and phase two at the same time. Again, subject to your approval, largely a, reflect in, a reflection of accomplishing the full community vision and also realizing it's cheaper to build it today than, to, than tomorrow. Uh, and so if we're going to uh, uh, proceed down this step, uh, uh, doing it today uh, is much cheaper, uh, knowing the escalation that we will certainly see in the future. You know, the last thing I'll say before I close out is uh, we are also working on a business plan for the facility uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the facility operates uh, where we are not um, operate, operates at, at a appropriate level to where it's covering its cost. Um, albeit with some subsidy, because every every recreation uh, department has some subsidy built into it, and we currently have a subsidy within our recreation department. You can't be in the pool business, the public pool business, and not have a subsidy. Uh, and so we are taking a look at uh, the current subsidy that has been budgeted uh, and building a business plan uh, upon that to make sure that uh, we can operate this facility uh, in the manner in which we know the community and the council expects. And so that concludes our update. Uh, and again, thank you to the entire team that has been, more, that has been working on this. Uh, and we are here for any questions or comments from the city council. Thank you. Thank you for the report. And uh, uh, the city clerk, if we can uh, let Mr. Lipinski in, he's been patient and appreciate it. And if there's anybody okay, else- Mr. The Lipinski, I am bringing you over now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it, thanks for letting me speak. Um, I just uh, got a couple comments. First off, you know, we're going to have this rec center that's going to have, you know, multiple pools and locker rooms, weight rooms, exercise area, shower rooms. Um, because government moves at such a small pace, and obviously that listening to the brief, the, the costs are kind of exponentially going uh, north. Um, you know, we, we don't adjust rapidly enough. You mentioned, but not provided any specifics on what's being done to mitigate COVID or future viral issues. Um, so we don't spend a whole lot of money on something that may be unusable. I mean, it's unlikely, but it's possible, you know, do we have a plan B? Um, 
And then my last thought is uh, to cover the shortfall, maybe you can market the naming rights to cover, you know, like uh, YouTube or walmart.com rec center. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments. Is, is there anybody else from the community that wishes to speak? If so, if you could uh, raise the virtual hand, we appreciate it. I see no hands raised. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring it back to council uh, for questions or comments, please. Council Member Mason. Hi, thanks um, for the presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, I guess a couple questions. I think in, in walking around, it's clear that some of the community isn't aware of the magnitude of the location. Um, and so I was hoping that maybe Don, who has been working on this since I was attending as a resident, these meetings um, could let us know com in comparison to where the rec center is today and the pool is today, how far is that new center going to cover that, that space? Um, if you go back, I don't know, Jovan, if you can share the slides, but we actually, one of the reasons we wanted to show that existing slide is you can see where the existing rec center is. Um, in relation to the street uh, where the school is across the way. And now if we go to the next slide, you can see that our new building basically sits on top of the existing building and then extends up towards the ball field. Um, and so it does extend um, along the backside of the park there. But when you look at what's being opened up in the park, it is significant. So from that existing pool that is kind of in the middle of the park and has the fence around it and there's this visual barrier, with the new plan, when you push the building and the pool together, um, the footprint does not become that much larger, but it's all contiguous along the backside of the park. We are opening up the entire park and the continuity and the connections in the park are going to be much improved by consolidating the building together along this backside. Great, thank you. Um, and then can you talk a little bit about the idea for the, the, the little like theater or amphitheater stage? Is yeah. Yeah, it was great. We were actually talking to the Lions last week and they were talking about, you know, how we're going to do our uh, pancake breakfast for the Easter egg hunt and where can different events happen. And so along the front of the building in that public plaza where the existing oak tree is, um, SWA, our landscape architect, has designed this beautiful plaza that's going to be able to use for community events. Um, it's really designed with some stadium seating that goes up to the pool deck level, which is about four or five feet above the plaza level. Um, so you'll be able to kind of use it informally as seating space or program it formally for recreation programs or use it for community events that can just fill out from the building out into the plaza and out into the park. And so on that site plan, um, I don't know if Jovan can uh, kind of zoom into that um, on your screen, but that existing public plaza that has been designed by SWA is going to be a fabulous amenity for the community and really tie into a lot of the events that you're already using in the park. Um, and then the relocated gazebo is going over to the opposite side and is going to provide kind of the counterbalance to activities that could happen on your large events. That's that dashed outline right there is the placeholder for the new gazebo. Great. Thank you. It's very, very exciting. Um, my next question is um, for our city manager. Thank you, Don. Um, Javon, I, I'm, I guess with the budget, it seems like it's been um, obviously increasing, but I would almost say fleeting. Um, at what point are we uh, going to, I don't, I'm, I actually am probably going to request it as opposed to ask when it would happen, but I just feel like we need to get to a budget that we are going to stick to because we're now three months away from the originally anticipated um, groundbreaking day. 
And so I understand that this has been delayed, obviously, because of COVID. But um, at what point are we going to get to a budget where the contingencies I see are built in? Um, and I think the last time we received this, it was 63.5 million, and now we're looking at almost $68 million. So I'd like to get to a point where we have a, a budget that we're really trying not to go over. Right. So uh, thank you, Council Member Mason. Uh, it, 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 a very valid question. The answer is a couple fold. Uh, what I would say, beginning from the outset, the number of $50 million was picked because that was a number that was thought to be an appropriate amount out of the $70 million that went to the foundation. The $50 million number really had no reflection to what it would cost to build the building that the community envisioned, right? And so it's not until you get into the design and start to uh, have projections on what the cost is, and we're looking at you know, almost $1,000 a square foot when you when you build in all the contingencies, and then we begin to value engineer. And there were a number of things that honestly were left on the cutting room floor um, uh, and, and talked about with the advisory committee uh, and a number of uh, the various staff, staff groups. And, and so part of the truth is we're not able to build what we uh, uh, first envisioned uh, with 67 million. I think the other answer to your question is, well, how did we get from 63 to 67, a $4 million increase? Well, part of that 2.8 million or nearly $3 million of that $4 million is actually funded in that it's from things that were always envisioned to be a part of the budget, but were gonna be funded by other sources. And so now they have been appended to the budget. And so I, I think that's a important thing to know when we talk about the budget increase. Right, because it really hasn't increased a full four million dollars in money that we need to find from May to September. It, part of that is representation. So I think that that, that that point is key to make. The other point is absolutely time is money. Uh, this is a very detailed model uh, that has been vetted not just by staff but by consultants, um, our uh, construction uh, management firm, and people that have very good estimates on what it costs uh, and what bids other agencies have been getting. The reality is we won't truly know until we go out to bid in December uh, and, and get those bid back, those bids back early 2021, what the true cost to build is. And we've already value engineered a lot out of this building and have a contingency plan built in because we have a phase one and a phase two. And so we are, approaching the end point of design and there are contingencies built in uh, with the design budget where as they final uh, finalize designing items the, the money will come out of contingency and it will go into construction or it will go away and the price will go down uh, and so we're getting there understand it's a very very long process understand uh, you know anytime you're building these uh, facilities the numbers always increase uh, and, and we're not taking that lightly uh, know that we um, are doing everything we can to get the estimated and projected cost of this building down. Uh, and we'll know when we go out to bid. Uh, with regard to COVID-19, uh, it was said uh, that, you know, do we have a uh, backup plan uh, uh, for COVID-19? Uh, know that uh, there are a lot of conversations with regard to the business plan uh, that is factoring in COVID-19. Uh, but we are also looking at a uh, 22 to 24 month construction cycle. Uh, and so uh, the effects of COVID-19, no one knows, uh, but uh, we, we're, we're forthrightly hoping that um, uh, as, a, as a society, uh, we'll, we'll be in a new place uh, when we uh, plan on opening this building uh, in 2023. Um, okay. So I don't know that we want to address this today, but I, I do want to just reiterate, I think we need to get to a budget that we don't want to pass. Um, I just am really uncomfortable with the amounts going up. I, I will say that 
you know, in comparison, the a park that was built in Burlingame cost over almost fifty million dollars. So I do understand that the cost is high, but I think with COVID, I'm also seeing that it's possible that construction costs may may go down depending on where the demand is, and then obviously that's kind of counter with uh, counterweighing counterbalancing, I should say, with all the fires happening, and then there's going to be new building needed there. So I'd be curious to see where that's going, but I do just want to reiterate, I think we need to get to a point where we say this is going to be the budget where we are doing everything we can to not pass it. And I just haven't seen any number that we're not trying to pass. Um, I also wanted to ask about the $500,000 delay. So because of COVID, this, I know uh, Park and Rec services are have slowed down, but uh, everyone's working to get, you know, everything's virtual and I think uh, they're doing a great job. But my question around the 500,000 is how are, how are we at half a million dollars for actually delaying a project? So that is additional consultant uh, services related to going through the environmental process that has been extended. And so it's not a um, delay and there, there's another cost increase for the expanded schedule. Right, but what you're talking about, that's actually a consultant cost uh, to go through the environmental process uh, and uh, the additional borings and things like that. Okay, so would that have to be paid anyway? So is it, is it not necessarily related to the delay is what I'm asking? Right, okay. it, it will have to be, it has increased um, due to the uh, extended review period, but uh, yes, it has to be paid. Okay, great. And then just one more, I think it's more of a comment, but um, uh, I think that while, I, while it seems, you know, that this is moving and I'm excited about it and everyone's working together to get, hopefully break ground in the spring, I do get a little concerned when I start seeing items being um, taken out of, uh, I heard develop, the development impact fees, um, because we do have so many other needs, including the fire department and the library. And so I just hesitate to put all of our money in one basket, um, if I may say that. This is gonna be a great project. I think it's gonna be beautiful, but um, to hear that this money had been allocated in advance, and I don't remember that when we approved the budget, um, I do get a little concerned because there, I think every council member probably has different projects that they maybe anticipate money being allocated to. And, um, and I don't know if what you said means that all these other projects are just going to be waiting um, because it sounds like from what you're saying, all this money is going into this particular project. Um, so it, it's, you can call, you can respond, um, but I, I do get a little hesitant because the development impact fees in particular, and I think I've heard before the park, the park fees, which are associated. I mean, we do have other parks also that need maintenance. Um, and I don't know if those are just going to wait while we build the aquatic center. Understand the question. Uh, right now, tonight, we're talking in a vacuum because we're only talking about this one project. Uh, okay. So I, I understand the intent of the uh, question. And so when we come back with the full financing plan for this building, I think what you're articulating and uh, the other members of the council will be interested in uh, is if we use money for this project, what does that mean for other projects? And, uh, and we can certainly uh, bring back that information um, at a top line uh, level. Uh, we, with the projections that we have, uh, the intent is not to use all of our available funds for this project and not to have anything available for anything anything else. So but, but we'll bring back the details, absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. And I just wanna reiterate my support. I know that costs have gone up over the last seven years. It's gone up in construction and every, everything else we can we could have anticipated. Um, but I, I really look forward to seeing this actually break ground. Thank you. Councilmember Medina. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll start off with, I understand budgets move things get delayed, um, environmental could be very expensive. So I, I get that. So we're, 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 we have a moving budget that's going up. We're trying to control it. When are we gonna finalize the funding mechanism? What, what, the, what is the schedule to do that uh, work or approval from the council? When are we gonna get it? 
so uh, we are aiming for uh, January, at uh, the end of January 2021, uh, and that's what we will be working uh, toward. But that's what we are, we are working toward. It's a, it's a schedule. Um, I heard that there were, uh, let me make sure this is right. So we have eight pre-qualified bidders on this project already? Yes, uh, there was Kelly Biggs. Uh, perfect, take that. Yeah, um, and I'll hand it over to Lance Solomon or to Jimmy Tan if there are detailed questions. This is a little outside of my area. But yes, um, we received five qualified out of the eight um, pre-qual uh, submittals. So we have five pre-qualified, eight total applications. Correct. And are those names available for the public to, to is it on the website or, or have we started vetting those? Well, we gotta be qualified, but just to know who the quality of the contractors, the builders, it'd be nice, I think, to share that information if it's if it can be shared. Lance or Jimmy, could you respond to that question? Sorry, yes, sure. Um, we do have a list of pre-qualified uh, contractors. Um, there is a, you know, um, a qualification of, of the document that they had to fill out and the, uh, all the contractors were vetted through that process. And so there are, you know, as Kelly mentioned, there are five contractors that have been um, you know, deemed to be you know, qualified. And, you know, we do have a list of all of them, you know, uh, Amoroso, you know, BHM, you know, Lake, Rob, Overa, and Swinerton. So um, okay. we, can, we can, you know, post this, um, the list, you know, on the city's website. You know, yeah. that's, that's not an issue at all. Great. Yeah. I just out of curiosity and just kind of, you said a couple of names I was familiar with, so it's good hearing those. Um, so thank you for that, uh, that que the answer for that question. Um, just had a, a couple, two questions about the actual rec center. Um, if, if we are going to go ahead and do the pool, outdoor pool, so the schematic that we're showing that the, the bird's eye view of that it shows it as a grass area but the location of that outdoor pool is still on that western side yes we pull that. yes and okay. we did not have a uh, image of that in this slide deck uh but in prior uh, slide decks we have and so we can send that to the city council okay uh, nope. that's great and and the community hall space uh for for somebody that had a party and they were dancing, the capacity is X. And if they were going to have a sit down dinner, the capacity is what? Approximately. Perfect, Don. <laughs> um, yes, for sitting at round tables for like banquet seating um, with space for a head table, it's 150 seating. If you do a combination of like cocktail, stand up, uh, dancing, um, you know, you can almost uh, probably increase that by 50 to 60 people. And then if you want like an assembly where you're looking at having a presentation or something, uh, probably 275 to 300. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, this project like, every, like everyone else and uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Vice Mayor Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I also have concerns about the budget. It's a 20% variance on a, on a project. And when we undertook this, it was a fully funded uh, project with dedicated funding. And so everybody felt pretty good about moving forward. And now that we're in a different financial situation, these variances, of course, um, take on a whole different dimension. And, uh, you know, looking back at, at a similar project that we've recently completed uh, with the reconstruction of the Glenview neighborhood, uh, I know there were a lot of uh, additional things that we that we added on there because it seemed appropriate. And, and it, I, I don't disagree that they were appropriate, but we, we added on a lot of things and the project grew and it grew to the point where we exceeded all our initial um, estimates on, on what it would cost. And it, uh, when it was all said and done, 
we, I, I think we were all surprised, but all along we kept agreeing to add this little thing here and this little thing there. And somehow it, it, uh, it got away from us. There, there was a little bit of scope creep. And uh, I, I understand that costs are going up and there are some um, unavoidable delays that are also running up the costs. Uh, but I also know that there are some things that we've added here. And, uh, you know, we, I, I don't believe we initially considered uh, what would happen in the surrounding area with the realignment of the creek and, and with moving the parking lot. I think the initial estimate really only looked at the construction of a building and the, all these other things are definitely important and they all complement this whole thing, the traffic circle, yeah, all of these things, but they are additional things that we've sort of thrown on top of this. And so uh, one of my questions would be, if we were to decouple some of those things from this project, could we get back to something that's more like our original budget and also potentially avoid some of the delays, especially around what the uh, Army Corps of Engineers do, Any, anything related to the environmentals of the creek, if we were to decouple that and say that will continue to happen on its own track, but separate from the construction of the building and would we be able to move forward uh, without those pieces or doing those on a parallel track uh, with uh, more more secure, more um, you know, well-defined funding, and as well as getting us back on something closer to our original timeline. I know it's only a couple of months, but uh, you know, if something, say, say if the, um, the analysis that's being done by the, the Army Corps of Engineers turns up some other artifacts in the area, and then that could lead to other delays. And so I'm wondering, could the building itself be decoupled? Is it really tied to all of these other things? And is there any way to adjust for that? Sure. Uh, let me take the first part of that, and Kelly just popped in because uh, she knew I was going to point to her uh, for, for, for the uh, sequel part. Michael, all valid questions. Uh, a few minutes ago, staff reminded me that the $50 million budget was actually set in 2015, right? It was set through a community listening campaign and cost models from 2015. So now that we're talking about actually constructing a building in 2021 to 2023, uh, that has to be taken in, into consideration. Um, and you know, we could sort of go back on uh, the process over the last five years, but part of it is just that, that, that time. The other uh, part is you're, you're absolutely right. There were a number of exterior enhancements to the park that were added, nearly all were stripped away when we value engineered this building uh, over the last two years, uh, going from schematic design to construction documents. The two most significant things that remained were realigning the creek to um, address a safety issue with the current creek that floods and is in the, in the middle of parking. That is also connected with, we are building a larger building uh, and there are parking thresholds. And so we needed additional parking spaces. And so that gets at your other question of, can we decouple some of the uh, realignment of City Parkway uh, and parking from the building part? Of the answer to that is no. Um, what Kelly's probably gonna tell you more articulately uh, and um, is that once you do the sequel filing, the project is the project. Uh, and uh, we are currently going through that process. And so Kelly, do a better job at it. I think you did great. Um, so in terms of decoupling the building from the creek, unfortunately, that's just not something that the core will do. They really do think of the project holistically. Um, and I think even if if we found some way to not relocate the creek, which I think everyone can agree that relocating the creek is the right thing to do from like a water quality perspective, a safety perspective, from all kinds of um, vantage points. I think that we would still be in the same situation with the archeological um, sensitivity now that that's a known factor. Um, and we also had a really good conversation with the core. Um, I think we're all on the same page and I don't anticipate that really driving delays at this point. 
the one last item that I will mention is that um, the roundabout installation or the signalization of the intersection is actually um, part of the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and is required by the project's EIR to mitigate a traffic impact um, at that intersection. All right, thank you. I, I had to ask the question, and you know, I, I've actually been asking for um, the, the creek relocation since before we even talked about this project. I mean, that's always been a concern of mine. So I, I was actually really happy to see that that was going to be included. Um, but just in terms of trying to move this ahead, I was just wondering, um, and you know, and just listening to all of the potential um, sources of, of funding for this, I, I don't think any of them are really um, ideal. Uh, and, and I, you know, as was mentioned previously, uh, there are a lot of competing demands for those funds, and so it, it would be it would be difficult to figure out which other projects don't get funded so that we can move forward with this. It, this is going to be amazing for the city, uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't actually have a lot of um, uh, we have no shortage of, of other projects. So uh, I appreciate the answer on that. Uh, and one final question related again to the realignment um, since it's something that has to be included um, I'm wondering in in the um, the overhead view that we saw it looks like the roadway is dramatically narrowed going through the park which I think is, is a really good idea uh, there's a lot of speeding that happens through the park and there's been a lot of concerns about uh, safety the, the, the you know children crossing that roadway um, I, I noticed that the um, the pathways that, that are drawn out, and I know this is probably really preliminary at this point, but the pathways still seem to divert people to the curved sections of the roadway where there's probably less visibility for cars coming around. And so I'm wondering if that was taken into consideration in terms of the, the safety and crossing um, City Park Way, if where we those little pathways empty out or they hit the street and come across, are we, um, you know, taking the, the visibility of the cars that are coming through there into consideration and are we anticipating a slower uh, flow of traffic through there because it's narrower? So I can start um, answering that question and others, please feel free to chime in. So um, we actually did have um, the city traffic engineer look at the site distance um, and we've actually relocated them to their current positions the pedestrian crosswalks as well as the drive aisle entrances into the parking lot to distance those further from the future roundabout or signalized intersection at city park way and crystal springs um, so that has definitely been taken into consideration um, and those will also be marked pedestrian crosswalks and I think just additionally, um, so the curving of the road is also intentional in that it is traffic calming as well. And so the straighter and the wider the road, the faster you drive. And so um, putting in those gentle curves in addition to the designated crosswalks um, was also part of the strategy from um, traffic engineers input as well as landscape architects. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Hey, seeing no other hands up uh, again, thank you for the report and update and thank you council for, I'm um, sorry, council member Davis. Mm, sorry about that. I was actually really waiting for everybody to comment because you and I have been on the subcommittee. So we've been getting updates all along. You know, this, this presentation um, was really, I think very challenging for everybody because there's been so much work put into this project. And it seems like every few months um, we come back together and we get an update and there's some other detour that these guys have to work through and another challenge. And, and every single time they're coming up with additional solutions and how we can work through it and how we can work on other, other pieces of it so we don't delay the project. Um, that has happened at every turn that we make. There, there are so many details that it's, you know, staff doesn't have the time tonight to go through throughout this project that I'm just overwhelmed on the amount of requirements that you have on a project this size. Um, and so somebody will always ask, God, when is that project, when is that new facility ever gonna get built? When is that new facility ever get built? And yeah, it's a painstaking process. And I think that this team has done an excellent job. Um, honestly, we, we got on um, 
on, on with this project way before Javon was ever even on um, this project as a city manager. And we kind of had to reset again with sort of new staff and new members coming on, including Keith, our finance director, and um, the Joanne, who was uh, uh, the park and recreations. And so, and there's even new people today. But along those, those hurdles, they've stayed focused and they continue to make progress um, and, and always cease to amaze me. Um, at every single one of the meetings, we have representatives as city council members, representatives from the Park and Rec Commission, representative from um, also the Planning Commission. And we always come out with sort of a unified uh, support and feedback for this team and the work that they're doing. So although in a very short amount of time, the presentation really couldn't show it tonight, there's so much work that's gone in behind the scenes. Um, you know, just picking bathroom tiles or floor tiles is, is a process we've all gone through to get to where we're at. Picking wall color, we, we've had disagreements on the gym colors and, and the seating and the lighting and this and that. So much work is done. It takes really a, a village to, to come together and to think about all the pieces. Um, and I remember in the very beginning, and, and honestly, it was a time when Jovan saw my mouth drop and that is 50 million isn't gonna get us a community room. 50 million isn't gonna get us an outdoor pool. 50 million is not gonna get us an, an um, raised track. And I just felt that these were things, and I think the other members did, that these are kind of really important things. That you know, having a, a place where people can safely, whether it's elderly people or children, walk 12 months out of the year, in a gymnasium and get some exercise, which is so important for the health of so many people, um, that they won't worry about trips from the roots on the ground or the steps or the sidewalk, et cetera, that they can actually get some really well, well needed exercise. Um, the community room that can bring our city together in so many different ways for a facility that doesn't exist in San Bruno, um, that, that, is, that will be that nice um, outside of the senior center. And the exercise room, it, it was a last minute um, decision. And I think that it's a good decision at, while we're in it and we're doing it, that we spend that money now because it, it'll really save us in the long run. And, and there are a number of things from the generator to the solar um, that I think should need to come because if we find ways to put them off because we don't have the funding today, they will always cost us double and triple the cost down the road or never happen at all. So I see how challenging this is. I think the most challenging thing is going to really be for city manager is really figuring out and presenting a way to fund this that will be um, something that we as all council members or future council members can actually support. Um, I hear us go back to the Measure G funding again, and I really hate to hear that. I understand it was important for COVID um, and it was a unique situation, but Measure G was really earmarked for those things and improving um, our city facilities through streets and roads and, and different things and sidewalks and, and fire mitigation. I think those are priorities and this is not a priority for that, that kind of thing. So kudos to the team, um, Don and, um, and, and you're, you know, there's a group of people that we've all worked with. Um, fabulous job and, and great presentation and, and doing um, a really tremendous job in sort of explaining the new building and the design. It's exciting and we are getting there, we are getting close. And so I can't wait to see groundbreaking. Well, thank you everybody for your, your comments. And, and like was said too, whether it's the, the rec center has been deemed historical, which delayed it, the uh, army of engineers delayed it. So some of the things are out of our control. I think there's about eight different agencies that have to review and sign off on this before we can get to the next step. Um, I think, and again, the city manager has alluded to this, that this is something that comes back to the council as a whole. When we, when we, when we talk about where do we want to go in revenue sources, and it's not that any X in my world, X hasn't been divided from the impact fees to this. However, in the impact fees, there are buckets. And that's what I think he was alluding to, that there was a potential of using some of that. But that comes back to this council. Uh, those that will make those decisions. So uh, I want to thank uh, uh, staff for the uh, report and updating the council uh, with nothing else at this time. Thank you again for all. I'm sorry. Sir, Mr. Mayor, uh, before we close out, uh, Audrey yes. Jones Taylor uh, has been, uh, uh, she's in the center of my screen and, and, and her, her video is up. She stepped in uh, as the project manager in May when the community services director left. And so I just want to acknowledge her because frankly, she's the one behind the scenes 
uh, pushing and driving the team uh, and it is really why we have not lost the beat uh, over these last uh, four months uh, when we had a, a change and shift and shift. So she came in having experience with building large uh, uh, facilities and running them. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of the entire team. And I, and I know we didn't acknowledge you earlier on. And so uh, my bad, but thank you. Thank, thank you, city manager. Thank you, Audrey. Uh,